Welcome back to another class of the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. I'm Curtis Hartshorn. I want to encourage you to get out your workbook and you can open that up to the ninth class. It should say Thessalonica, the impact of the plain gospel. And of course, we always want to encourage you to get your Bible open and you can open that to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be there in a moment. Each of these books has a different aspect of the gospel that it emphasizes. But when it comes to the church in Thessalonica, whom Paul addressed two letters to, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, we see that the gospel had a tremendous impact on that city. And so that's what we're going to look at in this class. The first point, A, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit-powered gospel. And under that, point number one, the gospel is more than mere words. So let me show you what I mean by that. If you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll read together starting in verse 2. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you, for your sake. He says here the gospel is not a matter of just words only. There's more to it than that. And he commends them. Notice how positive he is here, just like he was with the church in Philippi. He says, I, I'm just so proud of you. He talks in verse 3 about your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope. Notice the, the faith and the love and the hope. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul talked about how these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And here he commends the, the Thessalonians for having all three of those. He talks about their being chosen by God in verse 14. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you for our gospel. And this gospel is more than just mere words. We see, point number two, that we proclaim this gospel out of a strong conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit. Going on in verse 5, it says, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. We want to preach the gospel with a conviction about this. I'm convicted. This is right. This is true. And that conviction will come through in your presentation of the gospel if it's truly there. We also want to understand we, are, we have the gift of God's Holy Spirit, and we're preaching by the power of that Holy Spirit. Number three, this Holy Spirit power gospel must be preached even, even during adverse conditions. He goes on in chapter 2, in the first verse, and says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Paul was boldly proclaiming the gospel there in Thessalonica. And if you're not familiar with Acts 17, you may want to pause this video and go back and read the first half of Acts chapter 17 and see how that work went in Thessalonica. It was not easy. He faced a lot of opposition. He preached the gospel there in the synagogue, and some liked it, some responded. Many obeyed the gospel, but there were many who did not. And so this, uh, this gospel that we preach, is it draws opposition. But even in the most adverse 
situations, we need to make sure that we continue to preach the gospel. There's a suffering that comes as a result of our dedication to the gospel that we need to be aware of. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Now just for context, we're studying 1 Thessalonians, which was written to a church. 2 Timothy was not written to a church. It was written to an individual, Timothy. And Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. He is telling Timothy, if you preach the gospel, sooner or later there's going to be a suffering, there's going to be an opposition to what you're preaching. That's okay, Timothy. You keep preaching the word. The second point that we want to bring out from 1 Thessalonians, is where we're at still, is what I'm going to call not only the gospel. I think you'll understand the title there in just a moment. We go to the second chapter where we started off. Uh, we read 1 through 4. Let's, let's read where we stopped there in verse 5. It says, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext of greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. Even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But we proved to be gentle among you, as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection of you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives as well. Paul first starts off by talking about this embellishment. He says we, we didn't embellish the gospel with any flattering speech. And I brought this out in the very first class that we did when we were talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 16 where Paul's trying to remember who all he baptized. He says, now I, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. And that's where our title comes from. The plain gospel, not with flattering speech, he says here, not with cleverness of speech. He goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1 and says, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There we have it again, just the plain Gospel. He goes on in verse 4 and says, And my message and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Over and over again, Paul is emphasizing it's not about the eloquence that we have as presenters. It's not how, how good you are or how smart you are. It's about the gospel. Just present the gospel. That's all we really need to do. But we present not only the gospel. Number two, don't just share the gospel with people. Share your life with them as well. We see this in verse 8. It says, We are well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become very dear to us. I've mentioned several times during this series the the cohesion, the closeness that comes about from people who are of like mind, sharing the same gospel, working together. I was just talking with a, a colleague of mine just a little bit ago about how lighthouses don't compete. They work together. you got a lighthouse and you're shining the light, and I've got a lighthouse and I'm shining the light. We're not in competition with each other. We're working together to save sailors. That's what lighthouses do. They, they protect the sailors from dashing their ships against the rocks. We're spreading the light. We're working together. And we have a, a bond, a, a, uh, a fellowship as a result of our prayer, sharing the gospel. But we don't just share the gospel. We share our lives. We're, we get involved with people. We talk to people. When Paul, again, was writing to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death 
and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. What brings life? The gospel. What brings immortality? Our understanding. I, I know more about life and I know more about immortality since I became a Christian. And the more I've learned about the gospel, it teaches me about life, about living. That's what the gospel is supposed to do. You see, it's not only the gospel. It's our lives as well. Number three, we have been called into God's kingdom to proclaim this gospel of God. In chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, reading together in verse 9. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are a witness, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you, believers, just as you know how we, are, we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. You know, earlier in verse 7, he mentioned how we were gentle like a nursing mother. And now he says, we are imploring and encouraging and exhorting you as a loving father would. Verse 12, so that you would walk in the manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is our calling, whether we understand it or not. And maybe this wasn't explained to you when you first got baptized into Christ, but it's not too late to make this correction in your theology and understanding. You're called to proclaim the gospel, regardless of what age you are, regardless of what talents or abilities you have or don't have. Every single Christian is called to proclaim the gospel of God's kingdom. In fact, number four, that's what we're destined for. We were destined for the proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Look over at chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother. Now, we were introduced to Timothy in our study of Philippians, and we know how much Paul loved Timothy. Look what he says about him here. We sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. He says in this proclamation of the gospel, and as we're, we're going about what we need to do as a church, as the Lord's body, there's going to be some, some hardship. There's going to be some affliction. Don't let that discourage you. Don't let these afflictions discourage you. Realize this is what we're destined for. We're doing the right thing when we proclaim the gospel, the plain gospel to others. Going back again to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 8, it says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, a descendant of David, according to my gospel. I was, uh, let me share a story with you. I was at a, a gospel meeting not long ago. I was sitting with a, a dear brother, some of them I'm close to, and we were listening to the sermon. And when it was done, I, I thought the guy did a really good job with the sermon, but I looked over at my friend and he had the scowl on his face, like I, I dare you to make me smile kind of look. And I said, you know, what did you think of the message? He says, well, I didn't hear the gospel preached. Now, what this brother means, and I know because I've talked to him about this before, the brother in his sermon did not mention the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And in this guy's mind, that means it wasn't a gospel sermon. I want to challenge that because I know that's a very popular thing, uh, or it, it's, I don't know how popular it is, but I've heard it before, where people think if a sermon doesn't mention the death, burial, and the resurrection, it's not a gospel sermon. Think about this with me. Did John the baptizer, did he preach the gospel? Or, or better yet, how about Jesus? Did Jesus Christ preach the gospel? Well, Matthew 4.23 says Jesus was going throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. That's Matthew 4.23. Do you know what he was doing in the next chapter? Matthew 5-7, through 7, he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached. Was that a gospel sermon? You know where I'm going with this. He never mentions the death, burial, and the resurrection. 
And you might say, well, Curtis, that's not fair because that was before the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I know, but the point is the, the Bible says he was proclaiming the gospel, Matthew 4, 23. And then he turns around and preaches a gospel sermon, unless you're going to say that's not a gospel sermon. He, pre he preaches a gospel sermon without mentioning the death, burial, and the resurrection. There's more to the gospel than that. I hope you've, you've caught that already. That passage I just read in 2 Timothy 2 verse 8 says, Remember Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. So according to the gospel, not only is the resurrection important, but the Davidic ancestry of Jesus is important. Do we have to mention every time we preach a sermon that Jesus was a descendant of David? Well, obviously not. That's part of the gospel. And the death, the burial, and the resurrection, don't get me wrong, that needs to be preached frequently from the pulpit. And that is of first importance. That's what 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4 talks about. This is of first importance, this death, burial, and the resurrection. It is the core of the gospel, but it is not the whole gospel. And just because we don't mention that in every single sermon doesn't mean it's not a gospel sermon. I, I hope I've, I've stated that in a, in a general and yet firm way that We've got to make sure we're clear in our thinking and what we challenge and, and what we're calling wrong that may not be wrong at all. When good news is being preached, the good news of salvation, that is a gospel sermon, regardless of whether it mentions the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ. This gospel is about salvation, and that's our third uh, point, C, our, our third main point, the gospel of salvation. Let's talk about that. And now we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians, point number one. And this may not sound like it ties in, but I'll, I'll tie it in here in a second. A king is responsible for maintaining the safety of his kingdom. I want you to think about that as we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 5. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who were afflicted and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. Here's the point I want to make about a king. Back in biblical times, if you joined a kingdom, if you moved in to be part of a kingdom, you fully expected to be under the protection of that king. You know, if, if, you, if you were attacked and you're by another nation and uh, your, your family was, was harmed and your, your possessions were taken and uh, you went and told the king, and he said, man, so, big deal, that's nothing. Well, that's not a very good king. A king is responsible for the safety of his kingdom. And I, I mention that because I've heard people talk about God and how, how cruel he is because here he talks about eternal destruction in verse 9, away from the presence of the Lord. That's talking about hell. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, I can't believe a, a loving God would actually send people to hell? Well, how could a loving God not protect his own kingdom? not defend what is right and true and just. Look back at verse 6 again. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. It's just just. God is a loving God, but He's also a just and a fair God. This gospel that we're proclaiming is a gospel of salvation. And number two, the gospel is something which must be obeyed in order to escape the punishment of God. In other words, in order to receive that salvation. Verse 8 says he's dealing out retribution, this is God, to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to escape this punishment, this retribution of God, you need to know God 
and you need to obey the gospel of God. What does it mean to obey the gospel of God? Well, you're going to have to wait to class number 10 to get to the answer to that because that's what the whole class is going to be. I promise you we'll answer that very thoroughly in our next session. Number three, note that you were chosen from the beginning for salvation. We've We've encountered this several times in the New Testament, but we see it again starting in verse 8 of chapter 2. We're in 2 Thessalonians. Then that lawless one will be revealed, and I'm not going to uh, unwrap the man of lawlessness in this study. We'll save that for another time. But this lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took a pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You were chosen for this. He says that in verse 13. God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. God's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to eternal life. I've said this in so many different ways, but this is really what we are destined to do. God made you for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel to others. First, at receiving it yourself and obeying the gospel, which again, we'll talk about here in the next class, but also in the proclamation, in the furtherance of the gospel. You are chosen to be saved. God wants you to be saved. Now, you can reject your destiny just like any of us can. You can say, well, I'm not going to do that. But it's, you're going to spend your life doing something that God didn't intend for you to be doing. You're going to waste your life pursuing other things when you could be pursuing what you were really created to do. And that is to receive salvation and to share salvation with other people. Talking about the gospel of salvation, point number four, it is through the gospel that we receive salvation, the glory of our Lord. Look again at verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification in the spirit and faith and truth. And it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the gospel, we receive salvation, and that is to God's glory. Our gospel, once that gospel is proclaimed, I think about what we see here in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and tying this back again to Acts chapter 17. Once that gospel was preached in Thessalonica, that city was never the same again. The gospel had an impact on all these first century areas, these, these communities. You know, there's really no reason why it can't have the same impact today on your community in the 21st century. The gospel hasn't changed. It's still the plain gospel, the simple, truthful word of God. And it can have an impact on you and on your community if you will allow it to. I can't believe we're just down to to our last class here, but we're going to talk one more time I'm going to do a class for you on obeying the plain gospel. We're not going to stay with one book this time. We're going to be all over, but we're going to bring this all to a culmination and talk about really, honestly, what is the gospel and what are we supposed to do with it? We'll see you next time.